Hi, it's Mr. C and Mr. Risner. And we're here today to go over some things to explain for you and show you how to do the group one and two metals lab that we'll be doing to study parts of the periodic table. Group one and two metals are particularly reactive and there's differences between the two groups, which are the columns, group one and group two on the periodic table and also differences across a period, so from left to right, or if you were from uh, uh, sodium to magnesium, potassium to calcium. Uh, so we want to um, uh, introduce the idea that uh, we're gonna look for patterns in reactivity. Yeah, so we'll look for which ones are more reactive, group one or group two, and then if they're more reactive on the top or at the bottom. Now in this tray we've got some samples of the five metals that are going to be tested. The magnesium, the calcium, the lithium, the sodium, and the potassium. Now you can see that these four are very corroded on the outside, so we're going to cut them so you can see how shiny they are on the inside. And notice also how soft the group one metals are compared to the group two. Okay. So here I've got some templates for the five metals that will be tested. They're going to be bore model templates. I'm going to create bore models for all of these. Whereas for your actual write-up, you should be creating the electron configuration or using an off bow diagram to explain these better. To start off, I'm going to be putting in how many protons there are in the nucleus, and that is going to be based on their atomic number from the periodic table. Their atomic number and their definition as an element is based on how many protons are in its nucleus. I'm not going to put any neutrons in the nucleus because it shouldn't be changing through this reaction. Any changes to the nucleus would be a nuclear reaction, not a chemical reaction. The number of protons is important because the lithium that we're going to be putting into water, they're neutral atoms of lithium. And so, because there are three protons, there have to be three negatively charged electrons to balance out and be neutral. Next is sodium. It will have 11 protons in the nucleus and 11 electrons. And remember that in the Bohr model that only two electrons can fit in the first ring, and then eight, and then eight in the next two. And so for sodium, the Bohr model has the first ring full, the second ring full, and the third ring with only one electron, and the fourth ring empty. Next is magnesium. Based on its location on the periodic table, its atomic number is 12, and so it has to have 12 protons and 12 electrons. It has its first ring full, its second ring full, and its third energy level or ring with two electrons. Potassium should have 19 protons in the nucleus, and if it's going to be a neutral atom of potassium, then it will have 19 electrons. So for a neutral atom of potassium, it has its first ring full with two electrons, its second ring or energy level full with eight electrons, its third energy level is full with eight electrons, and it has 
one remaining in its fourth energy level. Now we have calcium with 20 protons, and for a neutral atom of calcium, it will have 20 electrons. Now this is a neutral atom of calcium with two electrons in its first energy level, and that's full. Eight in the second, eight in the third, which are all full. And then the fourth energy level is only partly full with two electrons. Now, when we're talking about these atoms, they were all neutral, and that does not mean the same thing as stable. Neutral just means that the number of protons and electrons are equal. Stable means that an atom wouldn't react, and atoms are stable if for all of their energy levels that they have, they're either full or completely empty. And so you can see lithium, while it is neutral, it is not stable. This energy level is full, this energy level is not full. And so to react, to become stable, lithium could either fill this energy level with electrons by pulling them from other atoms, or it could simply give this one away. And that is why lithium, a metal, will become stable more easily by giving away this electron to become a lithium ion with a one plus charge. It will have a one plus charge because it will have three protons that are positive, but only two electrons that are negative. So it will not be neutral, but it will be stable. Now here I've arranged the five diagrams of the metals that we'll be using where they would appear on the periodic table. So you can see lithium, sodium, and potassium are the group one metals. And notice that as group one metals, what they have in common is that whatever their outer energy level is, it has one electron. And so they all, to become stable, would lose one electron. Group two metals, magnesium and calcium, both have two electrons in their outermost energy level that contains electrons. And so they would both react by losing those two electrons to become stable. What things in the same period have in common are not their number of valence electrons, valence electrons being the ones in the outermost shell, but what are in the middle called their kernel electrons. You can see two and eight, two and eight. 288-288. For the first reaction, we're going to be taking a small piece of magnesium and reacting it with the water. To see the product, magnesium hydroxide, that's produced, it dissolves in water and it's clear, and so we're going to add a chemical indicator called phenolphthalein. It'll turn pink when any hydroxides are produced, including magnesium hydroxide. So as with all group one and two metals, when they chemically interact with the water, they produce a gas as well, or in addition to a hydroxide, a soluble hydroxide. Sometimes the hydroxide's insoluble. It depends on which metals. You go down the groups on the periodic table, the hydroxides become insoluble, uh, particularly in group two. But you can see the bubbles rising up from the magnesium as it reacts with the water. So this reaction is progressing so slowly that you don't really feel any sort of 
heat being generated by the by the reaction. The tube is cool to the touch. Next we're going to test how calcium metal reacts with water. This is not like the calcium that's in your teeth or your bones. That calcium that's in your teeth and bones, those are calcium ions. This is neutral calcium. The biggest difference between neutral calcium and neutral magnesium in terms of its Bohr model is that the two electrons that are going to be lost are further away from the nucleus. So we're going to see if that makes them react quicker or slower. So this tube is warm relative to the prior magnesium one. You can see the same gas production, only at a much faster rate. And the indicator is darker. So so the gas production on this reaction is much faster. So let's test and see if we are getting a flammable gas or not. Okay, we'll start with the, uh, the lithium in water. So I'll just take this piece here and try and get a comparatively sized piece to what we used for the magnesium and the calcium so we're not making that a variable the size we had, we had used quite a bit more magnesium one piece of calcium and this is a similarly sized piece of lithium what i've done is i've put about 200 mils of water in each of these three 600 mil beakers and we've added some phenolphthalein to the water in each one so you can see uh, the same hydroxide production if it, if it occurs. So here goes the lithium. So the gas production is occurring as it did for the others, group two metals and the lithium is producing quite a bit of hydroxide in its chemical interaction with the water. There's also some additional um, smoke coming off of that. The reaction rate for this one is quite a bit quicker than the magnesium, uh, maybe even the calcium. That's lithium. Okay, so now I'll put a piece of sodium. And I'm going to cover these bottles with the metal and get them out of the way. So here's a piece of sodium. Notice how the sodium, the heat of that reaction, has actually turned that little metal piece into a spherical shape, just kind of dancing around on the surface. Hot enough to melt the metal 
Mm. And finally, a piece of potassium. So, So the rate of reaction for this one was very quick. It even was hot enough to ignite the gas and you could see the emission spectra of potassium, that familiar um, pinkish hue that we saw for uh, uh, potassium in the uh, emission spectra lab. Right, uh, thanks for being with us today. Hopefully this goes well for you in class, and hopefully you were able to see those patterns that whether it was more reactive on the right or on the left, or whether they were more reactive on the top or on the bottom.